So, Ben, how you doing, my friend? Yeah, I am doing very well. Thanks so much for reaching out. This will be great. Oh, thank you so much yourself. I was on Audible recently and I was looking for a new book and I was like, I have no idea what to get. I feel like I've been through them all. But, <laughs> <clears throat> um, you have a book which is titled um, Why You Get Sick. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, is it Why We Get Sick? And I was thinking, this is probably going to be like every other book. So I listened to the intro, you know, when you get a little sample of the book. Yeah. And I don't know who is the narrator of the book, but I actually, I do have him on a few other books. And I was like, I like this dude. Um, but as he started to read about it, I was like, this actually sounds very interesting as well. <laughs> yeah. I was like, do you know what? I'll, I'll give this a go. And as I started to go through it, I then noticed that was, there was a common theme on, um, I guess, that every uh, section or episode of the book in which it was talking a lot about insulin. And I was like, there's a lot to do with insulin here, isn't it? <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be based yeah, yeah. around insulin. And I was like, this is fascinating stuff. Like, how long did it take you to research all this stuff to do with Insulin. First of all, like, what is it you do? You're a, you're a, a scientist, prof, uh, um, professor, um, uh, researcher. Um, yeah, what is it? What is it you do exactly? And how how is it you got into uh, looking into so much to do with insulin? Yeah. Yes. Thanks again so much. Uh, so I yeah I am a research scientist and professor. My focus on insulin <clears throat> is one that evolved, but it all started in my master's degree, when I was getting a master's of science in the early, early 2000s, I had stumbled across, at the time I was studying exercise, uh, exercise physiology, and my, my interest was muscle cells, but I found a study that had been published that detailed how fat cells, when they grow, start secreting these pro-inflammatory proteins called cytokines. So these big fat, fatty fat cells become inflamed and then that inflammation increases insulin resistance, which is the foundation of type 2 diabetes. And that process, in my mind, connected these at the, what, what was being referred to as these twin epidemics of obesity and diabetes. You always see them moving in the same direction across all the countries of the world. And that started my interest in insulin resistance. So it's been this growing expertise from my master's degree, through my PhD, through my postdoctoral fellowship, and now the 10 years that I've been my own man, so to speak, running my own lab as a scientist. Uh, and, and my interest continues to grow just because insulin resistance itself continues to grow. More and more people are getting it, and it's, it's increasing the risk of more and more diseases. Uh, and that, that really was the impetus to, to write the book. I was teaching classes as a professor at my university, I was bringing up these topics. The class I teach is uh, a class called pathophysiology. So all the nursing and the pre-med students have to take it. And I thought, this is a relevant topic. Uh, am I able to convert this kind of classroom knowledge into a book that the average individual would be able to go through and not only understand all of it, but then appreciate this this disorder insulin resistance and see it the way i do yeah I, I didn't know it had so many connections to so so many different things i thought i don't know if if maybe you're overweight then that's pretty much it yeah there's so much so much um i don't know if this question could easily be answered but what would you say is is there like a main reason for insulin resistance? Is there a way of, okay, like this is a simple way of explaining a reason why it, insulin resistance occurs in the body? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So firstly, um, before the why, I'll just briefly mention the what. And insulin resistance is a disease of two problems and they, they always come together. One is that some cells of the body aren't responding to insulin as well as they used to. And then two, blood insulin levels themselves are chronically elevated. 
which a condition that we call hyperinsulinemia. So insulin's not working as well around the body and there's too much of it circulating. So that's insulin resistance itself. And that has some pretty catastrophic consequences, whether it's Alzheimer's disease or whether it's hypertension and heart failure or fatty liver disease or infertility. The most common infertilities in men and women are both both share an origin of insulin resistance. And even, Roger, not to not to assume your audience, but even the effect of insulin resistance on muscles. Uh, we know that in type people with type 2 diabetes, which is just insulin resistance gone really far, they have very high levels of amino acids circulating in their blood. And it's because the muscle cell can't use insulin to inhibit the breakdown of muscle protein anymore. And so as the muscle has become insulin resistant, insulin will normally tell the muscle to keep all the protein that it has and don't break down muscle protein. But the muscle becomes insulin resistant. And while insulin is screaming at it, telling it not to break down its own protein, the muscle isn't getting the message anymore. And so you have protein catabolism, which of course is the death of you know, muscle growth. You want it to be a net anabolic phenomenon, but the loss of insulin signaling means we have a net catabolic phenomenon and the muscles are literally leaking out their proteins as amino acids. So that's insulin resistance. Um, as, as we define the villain, but the origins or the backstory, there are a few key inputs or a few key stimuli that will promote insulin resistance in the body, like inflammation, as I mentioned from the inflamed fat cells, or uh, stress. Uh, sleep deprivation is a known cause of insulin resistance, albeit fairly acutely. You know, that one can come and go. And then the big one, the elephant in the room is... Uh, chronically elevated insulin itself. So if someone is eating a diet where they are spiking their insulin all day, and most people do, you, most people wake up and it is a starchy, sugary breakfast. Then it's a starchy, sugary mid-morning snack and the same for lunch, afternoon snack, dinner, evening snack. And it'll take insulin three or so hours to come back down from these kinds of starchy, sugary meals that we've all been told to eat. And then by right before it's had a chance to lower, we've spiked it back up with the next snack or the next meal. So we're living a life of chronically elevated insulin, and that pushes insulin resistance. So too much insulin is a driver of insulin resistance. And so it's, it really begins and ends with the food we eat. What we put in our mouths is either the culprit or the cure. Yeah, wow. Oh, a few questions come to mind. Um... Wow. So would you say that, let's say someone who is muscle bound and has low body fat, could they be insulin resistant as well? That would be very uncommon. Right. Um, very uncommon. Now, I'll, I'll say one, one interesting dimension to modern uh, bodybuilding would be the use of insulin. And uh, there is a misunderstanding, Roger, I hate for this to be a tangent, so I'll be brief, um, but there's a misunderstanding with regards to insulin's role on muscle building. Insulin does not provide a direct anabolic stimulus at the muscle. That doesn't happen. So this has been confirmed in isolated muscle cell experiments. Insulin will not promote the growth of um, protein in, within the muscle. That's other hormones, like especially growth hormone does that very, very well. And, and then, of course, the steroid hormones will do that as well. But insulin doesn't, and, but it is anti-catabolic. Insulin will prevent the breakdown of the muscle. And so that might be why an individual is inclined to use it. But unfortunately, um, chronically elevated insulin, like what happens by injecting insulin as an anabolic tool, will promote fat growth, whether it's in the liver or whether it's trying to grow the heart and, and develop a cardiomyopathy or an, an, an expanded heart, which is not a, not a good thing, increasing blood pressure or increasing visceral fat, potentially the fat behind the muscles um, in the abdomen. Uh, so uh, insulin's role in muscles is, is misunderstood, unfortunately. Right, right. What about, um, did you mention that uh, insulin issues can be genetic as well. Mm, mm, yeah. Yeah. So 
uh, yeah, you can, insulin resistance is um, does have a strong genetic component. So if someone has a parent, for example, who had type two diabetes or has type two diabetes, this individual will be much more likely to struggle with insulin resistance throughout their lives. And this is multifactorial. There's not a single gene mutation or mutations even too strong a word. Uh, like a, a, a polymorphism or a version of the gene that's just not quite as helpful or functional as maybe another version of the gene. Interestingly, Roger, one of the themes is what happens at fat cells, where some ethnicities will have these variations in genes that dictate how fat cells will grow. And let me let me just be, I'll briefly explain. When I did my postdoctoral fellowship, um, so after my PhD, I did in I, I did this in Singapore, you know, that beautiful former British Commonwealth in Southeast Asia, that little island, um, one of the, my favorite places on the planet. So we lived there. One of our little babies was born there. It's such an amazing place. But the Singapore government was very interested in studying type 2 diabetes and metabolic diseases because of how incredibly prevalent it's becoming in Singapore. Singapore is predominantly a Chinese ethnicity. Now, national, nationality, of course, they are Singaporean, but most of the citizens in Singapore, their background or their ethnicity is Chinese. And so it's interesting to see what could happen because you take someone of, say, Northern European descent, like my, some of my Scandinavian ancestors, you know, so a prototypical Caucasian European, and you compare that to a, a Chinese ethnicity man. And these two men, same age, same body weight, they both start gaining weight at the same rate. You know, they're both gaining the typical, you know, 10 pounds or whatever a year. The Chinese guy starts to get hypertension. He starts to get prediabetes or, you know, insulin resistance. His glucose is going up. His insulin's already gone up. And so he's getting all these metabolic problems. But at the same time, the Caucasian fellow was roughly the same body weight and he's doing fine. He hasn't started manifesting any kind of metabolic, you know, disability or, or, or compromised function. And, and so the Chinese guy starts to limit. He, he gets to a point where he, he's, he's only a little chubby and he's already um, having the problems that you would typically think only comes with someone who's quite overweight or obese. And that part of that, the same thing happens in Hispanics, like, like Mexicans, he, you know, here in the United States, that, that's a population that's, of course, quite prominent here. Uh, they also experience the same kind of limited ceiling. You know, they have a threshold that is much lower, whereas their fat cells are growing, they grow in a way that is much more problematic than say you'd find in someone of Caucasian or even African descent that falls into that same category, albeit not quite as not quite as high. I like to joke that if you really want to be obese, Roger, you want to be Caucasian because Caucasians appear to be able to carry fat much more than other ethnicities, but not all it, Caucasians, of course, there's variety within every ethnicity, but I'm just using this to highlight the fact that there is a genetic component to a predisposition towards insulin resistance. And a lot of it has to do with how people's fat cells grow and do they have the right genetics or wrong genetics, depending on how you want to look at it, where in some ethnicities, the number of fats or the size the fat cells can get is very limited. And if you start to push those fat cells to try to grow more than they already have, now you start having insulin resistance and metabolic problems. Essentially, the fat cells are telling the body, if I keep responding to insulin, I'm going to grow too much. So I need to become resistant to insulin. And then that starts spreading the insulin resistance throughout the body. In contrast, you have under in other individuals who genetics, whose genetics are such that rather than each individual fat cell growing to a maximum dimension, they grow a little and then they simply make a new fat cell. Then that one grows a little and they make a new fat cell. So paradoxically, these individuals whose fat cells are growing through hyperplasia rather than hypertrophy, the hyperplasia growth of the fat cell basically means these fat cells stay healthy and the person gets super obese. You know, these are the kinds of individuals who can get to 500 pounds, you know, or they're getting well over, you know, 250 kilo or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, pretty substantial. Most people can't get that fat. The majority of individuals could never get that big. You and I could never get that big. Um, some people can, and paradoxically, they stay 
you know, reasonably healthy, but that is a small subset of the population. The majority of us, regardless of ethnicity, fall into the aspect of fat cell hypertrophy, where the individual fat cell number is set. We don't make new fat cells only to replace one as one dies every 10 years or so. And, and so if, as we are pressuring the fat cells to store more energy because we're eating a lot and our insulin is high, the fat cells grow too big and then they become insulin resistant. And now you've tipped over the first domino and then the body starts becoming insulin resistant. Wow. That's really interesting. That's really, it made me question I mean, who is a single race now? We've got so many different. Oh, races. I totally agree. I totally, I love that you just said that, uh, Roger, for, for many, many reasons beyond the metabolic, but even the cultural issues that we see nowadays to try to lump anyone into one single race, you know, to say Ben is white, Roger is black. It, you, you lose so much nuance there. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not white. I'm Scotch, Irish, Jewish, Scandinavian. You know, you're not, you know, you, you would have ancestors from multiple different countries within Africa um, or, or anywhere else. And so I think, I love that you said that we all have so much mingling and it's only happening more and more. So it is indeed difficult to draw really tight lines or it's getting harder and harder and so these the genetics are mingling and and i think it's all the more reason to be cautious in how we throw the these words around race or ethnicity because they just and rightly so and and the soon the more this happens the better we're really blurring the lines more and more which i couldn't be happier about can i ask should a person try to eat food which is more close to maybe, I don't know, uh, what they understand their ancestors would eat? Mm, yeah, 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 that's a that's a great question. I, th I think so. Not that we can't use modern conveniences, right? I mean, not that we're going to start living like a caveman. Um, but I, I think our ancestors ate a particular balance of macronutrients that I think is relevant. So rather than, you know, trying to eat the specific foods that our ancestors ate, you know, our ancestors might have eaten, um, you know, raw liver from, from the game they kill. You know, you and I, we're, we don't want to go eat raw liver, you know, but, but I think there's something to be said for the macronutrients that they focused on. There's no question. We eat the biggest shift in our modern diet is the obsession on carbohydrates. Our ancestors would never have eaten that um, in, for many, many reasons. One, they couldn't have preserved them. You know, we have them packaged and they're in our refrigerators. Here we are, um, you're in the UK, I'm in the US. In the winter, we can go to the market and buy apples or a watermelon. You know, that's, that would be impossible. You know, there would have been a very narrow window to eat carbohydrates for our ancestors. And that would have been in the end of late summer, early fall because that's when fruits come into season or fruits and vegetables, at least in our area of the world, in our climates. Um, so we, the biggest shift is that we eat more carbohydrates and they're all of course processed. They're all from bags and boxes with barcodes. Um, so I think a return to a macronutrient mix that is more focused on protein and fat, because that is unquestionably what our ancestors would have eaten, regardless of where they, they originate from although there would be a common origin at one point anyway, but animal fats, animal foods um, are what our ancestors, you know, cut their teeth on. We've been eating animals since the beginning of our species and the leading theory of, of evolution, one call or one of the prominent ones is called the expensive tissue hypothesis. And this idea is based on, on the, a shift in eating patterns compared of, of humans compared to all other primates, if these are, you know, our, our so-called closest relatives in the animal kingdom, where we began eating other animals much more deliberately than other primates did. And that allowed two important adaptations. It allowed our intestines to get significantly shorter because meat is so much more nutrient dense. It requires our efforts, our, the, the intestines need so little effort to digest and get all of the, literally all of the essential nutrients it needs from meat, as opposed to trying to get nutrients from plants like other primates mostly do. You know, a gorilla has to spend every waking moment eating and then often eating its own feces to try to get nutrients from its gut bacteria that it can't get otherwise. And so that would be, you know, we just eat meat. So it allowed our intestines to get much, much shorter, which they are. And second, it allowed our brains to grow much bigger because we would just sit down and our ancestors would eat meat 
And then that was so nutrient dense that they were done eating for a day or two. And now they could just get curious and think and invent rather than constantly foraging for more, you know, plants, for more animals uh, or not, not animals, for, for more plants and fruits to eat, um, which is what other primates are doing. So we are, we are very unique within the animal kingdom. Um, now, I'm a very religious person, so I see something divine to all of this. But nevertheless, we're very unique. And, uh, and it could be because our ancestors started eating meat and, and we became, you know, our intestines shifted to be more, much more like a wolf. We have from mouth to anus, Roger, we have more in common with a wolf than we do our other primates. And I think we should eat that way. Wolves don't sit around eating fruits. Uh, we, and, and we shouldn't either, I think, to be, to be our strongest and most capable, um, we need to focus on protein and fat uh, those are the essential, literally the essential nutrients. There are such things as essential fats. All animal fats have them. There are such things as essential amino acids. All animal proteins have them. There is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate in humans. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't eat them. I'm not. And I'm not declaring war on all carbs, but they, there's literally no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. We can eat them in a good way, so they can very much be a part of a good, smart diet. There's no question, but we don't need them. And so I think we should shift our diet accordingly. Let's not have the thing we don't need be the bulk of everything we eat. Let's instead focus on the things we do need, whether it's for those of us that want to be strong and healthy as adults, or whether, you know, for both me and you, we want, to, we want our kids to be healthy and strong. That is my priority in our home, in the Bickman home. It's have you gotten your protein? Because I know that if it's an animal source protein, which it is in our home, it's going to come with good animal fats. And then I know that we're giving my, our children the essential nutrition they need to grow and be smart. Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. You mentioned about animal protein could have potentially been the reason why our our brains grew. Some people think that it might be fat. Oh, oh yeah. In fact, I, I think it is fat, Roger, right. to be clear. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I think it was our focus on fatty foods um, that, but in nature, those two always come together. That's why I kind of sometimes use them interchangeably, even though I, I know that they're not the same, but if someone's focusing on animal protein, they will get the fats that come with it. And so I very much agree our brains, our, our growth of the brain and our shrinking of the intestines um, very much likely had to do with the focus on fatty foods. And, and that, that is a shift in our diet. You know, our ancestors would have eaten the fattier cuts of meat, like liver maybe, or kidneys or the brain of, of animals, of the things we were killing. And now even in, not even that so distant past, right, Roger, and especially in the UK, not as much in the US with a shorter history, but there were like sweet meats and things that were from the actual brain of animals. And it wasn't so taboo. We never eat that way now. Hmm. We only eat the muscle meat, which is a leaner meat. And, and so I think it, it behooves us to not avoid the fat. God or nature put them together and the best animal pro the best proteins they, that happen to be animal proteins no plant protein can come even close to an animal protein in function in bioavailability the best proteins which are animal proteins always come with fat and we should eat it that way that's interesting i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna come to that in a moment uh, talking about uh, plants and mm -hmm. protein and bioavailability but one thing i wanted to ask was uh liver would you say that eating liver from uh, grass-fed uh, or grain-fed will be difference in nutritional value, not just not just uh, micronutrients but also macronutrients? Would you say that uh, the grain-fed would have more carbohydrates in there as well? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, no. No, the liver won't have, well, maybe it would have a modest, you know what, actually, I don't think it would. I've not seen this quantified though, Roger. I've not seen a study on this, so I am speculating a little. I would be very, very confident to say, I am very confident in saying there would not be a difference in the amount of, say, glycogen or the modest amount of carbohydrates stored in the liver between grain or grass-fed. There likely wouldn't be any differences in protein composition. There would likely be slight differences in the omega 
3 and omega-6 fatty acids. So the grass-fed would likely have somewhat higher omega-3 and somewhat lower omega-6. This has been shown in muscle meat and in, in dairy from grass versus grain-fed uh, fed dairy cows. But just to make it clear, these are very modest differences. And almost certainly in the US, and I bet it's this way in the UK, virtually every, all the cattle, beef and dairy, are, are grass fed, and then they may have like a grain finish to them at the end, where there, there's a brief period at the end where it's um, grain fed, which is not the animal's natural diet. You know, the magic of ruminants like cattle is that they eat grasses and something no, no other animals eat. And, and so I think we should feed them that way. That's what they're built to eat. But nevertheless, the, the shifts, the slight shifts in omega-3 and omega-6 fats I, I can't say that they actually have a physiological effect on us as we eat them. The differences in those fatty acids, while quantifiable in the laboratory, I don't think are ultimately meaningful in the human's body. Right. Sorry. Just to make sure I understand this uh, clearly, if I was to buy one or the other, there wouldn't be a major difference in nutritional value. Nope. No, nope. I mean, now that's I, and I don't mean to say though, Roger, that it's all hype and no one should ever get grass fed, kind of free a pasture raised um, cow or cattle or meat. N not at all. I, I think we ought to, in part because we are promoting a, a better way of ranching, you know, a more sustainable, um, humane way, which I think is something very important. We, as the dominant life form on this planet, I think we do have a responsibility to be good stewards um, of of everything that we're controlling, including how we're raising these these beef cattle. So I think there's something to be said for just grass fed free range um, meat or, or you know, organic in that regard. Um, but it, it's not necessarily because it's going to make that much of a health difference. And I think I would hope that someone listening to this would breathe a bit of a sigh of relief, because of course, that is a more expensive way of eating meat, whether it's meat or eggs. And I would hate for someone to listen to us and think, well, great, I can't afford those most expensive grass fed cuts of meat or the eggs. And so or, you know, the free range eggs. Um, so I'm, I'm just not going to even try. No, no, it's to get the normal right off the store versions of these meats and eggs is still going to be much, much better than anything else you're going to put in your mouth. It's just if you have the ability, then I think, yeah, then take that next step. What about <clears throat> there's other things that come with it? Um, I was thinking like when you get grain fed, they're normally, you know, pumped full of hormones as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So you right. So most of the hormones, um, now I, I, I'm getting a little outside my wheelhouse or my area of expertise. I don't know exactly what they're putting in these animals to help them grow faster or to help them stay healthy. Um, so I, 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 I believe many times they are given growth hormone when, when they are more grain fed, uh, uh, or maybe all of them, I don't know. But the, so I, I've heard people be worried about growth hormone, but growth hormone is a hormone that can't make it past our stomachs. So we eat the growth hormone and it's, a, it's what's called a peptide hormone. And the moment it hits our stomach acids, we have split it into all of its component amino acids. So it's just, there's nothing, there's nothing about growth hormone that's going to stay growth hormone in our bodies. We just change it into its building blocks and then we'll turn it into whatever we want later with those amino acids. Some of the antibiotics, so the more you're treating, uh, you're feeding an animal grain, the more they will get sick and you may have to give them antibiotics. Interestingly, Roger, antibiotics have been used in ranching or animal husbandry for a long time, because if you give an animal antibiotics, they will get fatter faster. That's, there's an important takeaway for humans too, right. which is to be cautious in how we treat our gut bacteria, because even in humans, excessive antibiotic use promotes weight gain. Right. All things equal, a person starts to get fatter the more they're taking strong antibiotics. And the same thing goes for these animals. And so it might be kind of used as a tool Let's give them antibiotics and help them get fatter. And then it's a juicier cut of meat. Now, I don't know the degree to which antibiotics are used. I've never seen that measured, but I would imagine the more an animal is fed grain, the more antibiotics they will need because grain isn't their natural diet. It's supposed to be grasses. And so that might make the animal fatter 
Um, and, and there might be some potential for antibiotics to get into the meat, but I've never seen that measured. That's just not something I'm familiar with. Right, okay. Um, the grains which they're fed, they're probably sprayed with glyphosate. And what we yeah. understand about glyphosate, um, that definitely gets transferred over to, to humans. Yeah, and I'm sure that's right. And once again, we've reached the limits of what I know in that regard. But yes, I would imagine that's the case. When you're, yeah, when you're giving the animal these, and a lot of them, you know, the, all this corn or soybean we're feeding them, it's coming from these big industrial farms. And, and so there's a lot of just messiness in this. And I think it's just tragic. These are, uh, because in part, humans can eat corn and soy. So why should we be giving them to them? That should be feeding humans. Let these animals, these magical ruminants, eat what no other animal can eat, which is grass. You know what? The ground will spontaneously produce these little grasses, sage grasses, almost anywhere on the planet. Let the ruminant, let the cattle eat the grasses and then, you know, use the other foods for other animals, at least, you know, maybe for pigs, which are monogastric like humans or just humans themselves. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. So let's steer it back to an area which you, you do know of. So we were speaking earlier about um, plants and like meat protein. I think you mentioned in your book that, which was really interesting, about plants having anti-nutrients. Yeah. And what, another thing is that they're high in carbohydrates. But the thing that stuck out for me was that the anti-nutrients... Uh, blocks the protein absorption. Yeah, isn't that something? That's insane. I know it's in, it's insane. Yeah, it's it's the kind of thing, Roger. When I first heard about it, and someone called said these plant anti nutrients, I thought, oh my gosh, you know what what villain are we making up now? I, I didn't believe it, but that is an honest to goodness term that is used to describe the molecules that are inherent within seeds of plants to try to discourage animals from eating their seeds. So of course, like every animal, like every life form on the planet, these plants, corn, soy, or pea, or pea and soy, especially when we're talking about proteins, there's the main plant proteins, they want to, they want to procreate, they want to make offspring to grow. And, uh, you know, a deer is as we are trying to eat the deer, an animal, a predator is trying to eat the deer, the deer has the ability to run away. And that's its defense. A plant can't get up and run away. And so it makes sense that the plant tries to have some inherent defense to try to discourage predators from eating it. And so it will, it has these things within its seeds, like anti-nutrients, to try to make sure that the animal is getting so little nutritional value from it that it wouldn't want to eat it in the future. And so, so the seeds have these they have they are enriched with these anti-nutrients things like trypsin inhibitors and tannins and a couple others that I, I can't remember off the top of my head but they are inherent in seeds now if you eat if you and i were to go eat a handful of peas we're getting negligible amounts of these anti-nutrients because they're so little within and of course more moreover roger we have raised we've bred these plants to have lower and lower levels of anti-nutrients because you know these are not the plants that our ancestors knew even 100 years ago an apple's not an apple peas aren't peas corn's not corn we've changed them dramatically to be starchy more starchy and sugary and have fewer problems with them like anti-nutrients but we end up having that work against us when we try to take protein from something that is so protein deficient you know, for example, if we're trying to get pea protein, which is maybe the most common protein nowadays, because it has a reasonably better amino acid profile than most other plant proteins, which is to say that it's still vastly inferior to animal proteins. But nevertheless, in order to get a serving of protein from peas, we have to take a thousand peas. And then we process them, we refine them in the factory. And now we've distilled the protein. In the, in the process though, as we've been concentrating the protein, we also concentrate these anti-nutrients. And so ironically, we're getting this protein and, and we're getting molecules in the protein that is directly blocking our intestines ability to digest it. That's not to say we're not getting any, 
but we're spending top dollar for this plant protein, which tastes like garbage. And we're not even getting all the protein we think we are. We're not even getting all the amino acids because these anti-nutrients are blocking our proteolytic enzymes from turning the proteins into the amino acids to allow us to absorb them. And it's that important step that gets blocked. It's taking the big protein and splitting it up with proteolytic enzymes into their component amino acids. And then those are what we absorb. Well, these anti-nutrients prevent that step to some degree. Again, I'm not saying that's happening totally, but some of it is getting lost in the process. And one last problem, Roger, is that the plant proteins, these artificial proteins, also don't have fats that come with them. And the best proteins come with fats, and that's for a reason. And that's because we digest, we literally digest protein better when we have fat with it. We know that when you eat fat, you have bile acids that get released from the gut, uh, from the liver or the gallbladder into the intestines. And bile acids facilitate fat digestion, but they also enhance proteolytic enzyme function. They literally improve protein uh, digestion at the same time. And that is very likely why in very well controlled human studies, when they measure muscle protein growth with a workout, and you give the person whey or egg whites, which are the best proteins, and they'll get detectable improvement in growth beyond just the workout alone. And then you give them a balance of one to one by weight, fat and protein, and you get a doubling of the muscle protein synthesis. It's fat and protein together are more anabolic than protein alone. That is amazing. That is, yeah, I did read that part. You did mention about you know, bioavailability of meat being better because the fats being yeah. with it as well. Did you also say that the fats make the protein more anabolic? Was yep, that yep, that? that's right. That's 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 exactly right. And and part of it might be due to the enhanced protein digestion that we just mentioned, but also it could be part of the fact that while a muscle cell is building protein within itself, and that's what's responsible for the hypertrophy and even a modest amount of hyperplasia, that's a misunderstood idea. There is in fact muscle hyperplasia, albeit to a very modest degree. But every time you're expanding the surface of the cell, you know, the cell was this big and now we're growing it to be this big, you have to, most of a cell membrane is made of fat. Every cell, every cell, muscle cells included. And so as you are growing the cell and you have more and more of the surface of the cell, you need more and more fat to actually grow that. That, that could be why omega-3 is also anabolic. That was another human study. And so that's why I strongly encourage guys that are, trying, that are seeking hypertrophy, make sure they're really taking strong high amounts of omega-3. Once again, that's an, an, that's an animal fat. You don't get functioning omega-3s from, from plants. So you need all the more reason to get your fats from animals. But even omega-3 alone is anabolic. It will facilitate muscle growth. Even in the absence of a protein um, supplement, just omega-3 alone can facilitate muscle growth. So fats are, I think, an overlooked aspect of, of hypertrophy. And while we're all focused on protein, rightly so, it's so anabolic in the midst combined with workouts that, that are smart. But fats and proteins are doubly anabolic. And I think we've made things so complicated by, by taking the whey out of the milk fat, by taking the egg whites away from the yolks um, or trimming off the fat or only eating chicken, which has very little fat anyway, we need to have fat coming with this protein, which is why in, in our history, when we would eat protein from animal sources, it always would have fat with it. And that's what we should do. Oh, that's really interesting. Just a quick one. Would you suggest it's better to have chicken with the skin as opposed to chicken without the skin? No, with absolutely with the skin, the more you can do to make the chicken a little fattier, the better you will, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we will digest it better and it will be more anabolic to our muscles and bones. Yeah. So whether it's with, the, I'd say with the skin and olive oil or butter, try to keep some fat with that protein. That's so cool. I'm so happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's like great news. Yeah, doctor's orders, Roger. <laughs> Keep the skin. <laughs> what about um, what about if I was to have a, a, a whey protein and uh, put some, I don't know, MCT in there? Mm -hmm. uh, what about olive oil? Would that, yeah, would that work as well? 
Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Anything to do in Roger. I think the fact that we digest protein better with fat is I think why so many people, um, they will take a, a whey and they'll, a whey shake and it'll upset their stomach. And so they'll say, Oh, I can't eat whey. It really upsets my stomach. And I'll tell them, what if you add some fat to it? Just like we discussed, you know, maybe some whole eggs. So you get the yolks or they can blend it up or some olive oil or MCT oil or coconut oil. And sure enough, they, they suddenly don't get an upset stomach when they take the whey anymore. Amazing. Would it be better to have those than to have nuts? Because nuts is higher in omega-6s, isn't it? Yeah, I think, actually, yes, I think so. Um, nuts are much higher in omega-6. Uh, and, and they also are much higher in starches, too. So depending on the nut, yeah. there, you know, there's quite a, a variety here. Um, but the nuts can really have a pretty meaningful amount of starch which will spike your insulin. And then, you know, rather than directing that muscle and protein for muscle, um, facilitating muscle growth, you may be pushing it more into the fat cells, which you don't want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, you'd mentioned something about mTOR. I think, um, I think it was on your post, actually. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting because longevity has become a very popular thing. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. You know, even myself, I think I jumped on that bandwagon. Yeah. Um, I think it's been probably about five years. I'm like, you know what? I need to focus a bit more on uh, nutritional value, nutrition, mm -hmm. you know, new, more, more nutritionally dense foods and uh, incorporating the trendy word biohacks into my life, yeah. like uh, red light therapy and yeah. um, cold therapy and all sorts of stuff. But one thing which I had read about was you know, for people who are trying to grow muscle, uh, mTOR is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And then it seemed as though mTOR had been just like vilified as, you know, the, the culprit for reducing longevity. And I'm thinking, well, I, I want to grow muscle and, yep. and mTOR is important. I want to live long. And I don't know, it's said to be bad. I'm like, my God, what, 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 I'm, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think you had mentioned that there's a lot of misconstrued information about mTOR. Would you yeah. be able to open on that and um, yeah. let us know what it is? What's the misinformation being told about mTOR? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, gladly. I'd love to. I have very strong feelings on this because I think it's so misunderstood. And there are so many prominent voices that I think are just spreading nonsense. So any uh, any cell that hopes to survive and grow must have some degree of mTOR activation. So mTOR is a master anabolic promoter. It wants a cell to grow regardless of the cell type, but the muscle cell and the bone cells are easy examples um, because it's such a prominent aspect. So mTOR is an, as a, a protein within the cell. It will, when it's turned on, it will turn on numerous anabolic and anti-catabolic processes. So wanting a muscle to grow. And, and, and Roger, to your point that you were touching on, um, having muscle is one of the greatest predictors of longevity. The more frail a person becomes, the more likely they are to die. And so there, you can already start to see the kind of um, uh, confusion in, in, this, in this promotion of, of trying to avoid mTOR. You can already start to see the house of cards crumbling a bit. So you have to have mTOR turned on. Now, importantly, with regards to muscle function, if mTOR is turned on incessantly, the, the cell starts to become resistant to mTOR. So we know that if you are stimulating a muscle to activate mTOR nonstop, it will start to shrink and become catabolic. The, the, so you can't keep mTOR turned on. You want to turn it on and then turn it off. So the key to functioning muscle growth and any other healthy cell is this cyclical nature of what I like to say, building and breaking. So you're building things up, but at the same time, you're allowing the cell to clear itself out and get rid of old parts of itself or autophagy. And so the muscle cell, as it's growing, it's kind of going like this. You have to have mTOR activating growth, then mTOR turns off, and then it's kind of opposite. A protein called AMPK will then become dominant, and it'll start to break it down a little bit. And so you have this cyclical period. So the, the key to growth with regards to mTOR is muscle growth is the cyclical activation of it. 
you need to turn it on and then you want it off. And that follows a smart pattern, a pattern of eating. You're eating proteins and then you're spiking mTOR and then you digest the proteins and mTOR can turn off for a time. And the same thing when you work out, you work out, mTOR is turned on and it's on for quite a while after and then it'll turn off to kind of clear house a bit. And then you are just having this net positive effect while you're having these subtle shifts throughout. Now, with regards to longevity, we learned years ago that in insects and rodents, <clears throat> if you keep mTOR turned down, the animal will live longer than if mTOR is higher up. And so this led to the prevailing thought that if you want to promote longevity, you want to reduce mTOR. That took one step further as they started to apply this to humans and other, other mammals like the rodents, that if you reduced protein, you cut down mTOR and then the animal would live longer. Now, it's hard to measure longevity in humans, right? That's a study that would have to go for 80 or 90 years. So you can't really do that. So you can only rely on weak correlational evidence, which is just looking at populations and trying to gauge what they're eating. Of course, there's a lot of problems with that. But those studies have been done, giving us the best evidence we have, which is not very strong evidence at all. But even still, they found there was this window of time in like someone's 50s, that if they ate more protein, they tended to die. They had a slightly higher mortality than the 50-year-olds who were eating less protein. But then to blow the whole idea apart, remember, we're talking about longevity. After their 60s, the people that ate the most protein lived the longest. The people that ate the least protein lived the shortest. Well, that's pretty damning evidence in my mind. Um, that should directly blow the whole idea apart that there's something inherently problematic about, about protein in the diet because of its mTOR effect. Protein has an acute mTOR effect. You eat protein with fat, hopefully, but you eat protein, mTOR is turned on and then it's off. But if mTOR really is shortening lifespan, and I mentioned how chronically elevated mTOR is problematic, all the more reason to worry about insulin because insulin will spike mTOR and keep it activated much, much longer than proteins will. And so if we put that back in the perspective of the paradigm we started the conversation with, which is the average individual living every waking moment is spent in a state of elevated insulin, but not elevated protein consumption. So now you can see where it might be a problem that this is a person whose mTOR is literally activated almost like maybe 18 or 20 hours in a day in a 24 hour period. Whereas if someone's eating a diet that is lower in refined starches and more focused on proteins and fats, they'll have an mTOR spike, it's up and then it's off an hour or 90 minutes later, as opposed to insulin, which is activating mTOR. Now that's up for three or three and a half hours. So all of this, I'm, I'm getting it a little complicated. So I will say, I'll sum it up this way. mTOR is essential. Cyclical mTOR activation is essential for muscle growth. Um, mTOR might be relevant to longevity, as we've seen in other animals like rodents. It might be relevant to human longevity, but that's not a reason to fear protein. It's all the more reason to respect insulin because insulin will keep mTOR activated chronically much more readily than any amino acids from dietary protein will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, glad you said that. <laughs> Not that I was eating any less protein anyway, but mm -hmm. it's the whole mTOR thing, you know. Yeah, it's uh, so overhyped. Yeah, and it was only really an, an animal study, which, yep. wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, would you be able to share that study with me? Oh, yeah, please? yeah. And so the lead author, I can send it to you I'm through Instagram, but the lead author, let me try to see if I can find it now. Um, the lead author, I think, was... Uh, Longo is the last name. I'm going to open up my file here and see if I can't give you the, um, I can't find it. I'll get it to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get it to me in your own time. That'll be superb. So if talking of um, insulin, I know that different hormones uh, affect insulin in different ways. And it's, it's really interesting. Um, <laughs> would you say that there are certain ones that affect insulin the most? Mm, yeah, yeah. So, uh, for example, stress. I mentioned how stress causes insulin resistance, and that's because the prototypical stress hormones, namely adrenaline, 
or, or also called epinephrine, and cortisol. Cortisol and epinephrine are the two stress hormones, and they are constantly trying to push glucose levels up. As a result, you're, they are actually indirectly constantly pushing insulin up, which is why they, those hormones cause insulin resistance quite quickly. Um, other hormones kind of mimic some of what insulin does without necessarily increasing insulin itself, like growth hormone. Growth hormone, if, if there is any hormone that is you know, magical to muscle growth and making an Adonis-like figure, it would, well, other than anabolic steroids, like, you know, testosterone molecules, but growth hormone would be it, um, like testosterone, because it's selectively promoting the growth of lean mass, muscle and bone, while directly um, promoting the shrinking of fat cells. So insulin wants both muscle cells and fat cells to grow. Growth hormone only wants muscle cells to grow, and it will directly in fact, it is so determined to fuel lean mass growth that it's actually activating fat cell or fat burning. It wants the fat cells to undergo lipolysis, to share its fats, to fuel the muscle growth. And so, um, so I'm kind of muddying the water here, but yes, some hormones are directly increasing insulin or indirectly. And then other hormones like growth hormone are kind of capturing or mimicking some of what insulin does, but not all of what insulin does. Hmm. That is really interesting. So many questions was coming in my head. Let me try and bring it a little bit further back. So, okay, once your stress hormone goes up, um, it raises it raises your glucose or blood sugar level. Yep, yep, that's right. Mm -hmm. How does that happen if your blood, let's say, your blood sugar is low, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you stress, and now it's higher? What, what does it do? Where would mm -hmm break it down from somewhere like yep yep that's right yep so so those stress hormones will directly tell the liver to start breaking down glycogen so the liver is taking in glucose and storing it for a later day and in the, in the form of what's called glycogen and then the moment the stress hormones start to climb they directly go to the liver cell and they say you've been storing this glucose as glycogen it's time to break it down and turn it back into glucose and release it into the bloodstream so if, if we injected someone with epinephrine or cortisol we would see an immediate rise in their blood glucose levels. And that's all from the liver. Now, Roger, relevant to say muscle mass uh, and muscle growth, <clears throat> cortisol in particular is so determined to raise glucose levels that it will start stripping the proteins from the muscle. It will literally activate catabolic breakdown of muscle protein to send those amino acids to the liver so that the liver can use some of those amino acids to turn it in, to turn them into glucose. So this process called gluconeogenesis. And normally the liver only uses, you know, uses amino acids very sparingly um, as, as a gluconeogenesis or as a, a backbone to form new glucose. But when cortisol in particular is up, again, it is so determined to increase glucose levels that it will start stripping proteins from the skin and from the muscle in order to just push the glucose up. So chronically elevated cortisol is absolutely catastrophic to human health. Mm. So can it get to a point where you have too much blood, uh, sorry, sugar in your blood because of the elevated cortisol and then you're, then you get more insulin pumped yep. in the blood. That's exactly it. Yep. That you just went through it exactly right. So cortisol is producing an upward pressure of the blood sugar. Insulin senses this and thinks, wait a minute, my job is to lower it. And so you now have these, these two proteins kind of at war indirectly through, through the glucose levels. It's like two combative, you know, divorced spouses who are fighting over the child and glucose is the kid. So, okay. All right. Stress is saying we need more <laughs> we need sugar in the blood. Insulin mm -hmm. says, no, we need it back out in the muscle. The stress is like, no, we need to keep it there. Yep, so, that's right. Okay, so they're both battling. Like, what's, what's, what, what, what happens afterwards? Yeah, yeah. So eventually, there has to be an end of the stress. If there isn't, this process will never stop. And, and so, uh, thankfully, there usually is an end to the stress. So if cortisol has climbed and it's busy because the person 
um, has had a hectic day, well, they go to bed and now all of a sudden it can come down and the process can reset perhaps before it starts all over again as the stress begins again. Um, the most, the most uh, catastrophic instances are when someone has a tumor that is secreting cortisol and that results in a disease called Cushing syndrome, which is absolutely debilitating. They literally start breaking down their muscle so they'll start wasting their muscle away. They'll start developing stretch marks on their skin because the cortisol is stripping the collagen away from the skin. So the skin's becoming weaker and more, more fragile. And throughout all of this, they start gaining fat because the insulin starts going up and insulin promotes fat storage, but they start storing their fat in their central area from their neck to their, to their groin. And they, they, they literally start clearing the fat away from their limbs. So you have a woman who's storing more of her fat, say, on her arms or her, or her butt and hips. And she starts moving that fat. The starts, cortisol starts breaking down the fat on, say, the butt and hips and starts mobilizing the fat and then storing it on the central, the trunk of the body. But everything metabolically starts to go awry when cortisol is elevated. And again, thankfully, it's usually only elevated acutely. But in these instances where it is elevated chronically, like in Cushing syndrome, it is, it is disastrous for the person. Wow. Wow. That's some interesting stuff. I think you had mentioned something about when a person trains, they don't actually get lactic acid. They, yeah. They, they lactate or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, don't, don't say that. They don't lactate. <laughs> Because that's what the that's what the pregnant mommy or that's what the recent mom is doing. Um, but they are making lactate. They're making um, lactate. Oh. Yeah, from their muscle. Yeah. Oh, please. Yeah. So so yeah, working muscle um produces lactate. And the more intensely you're working the muscle, the more lactate it's producing because it's relying and that's all because of the energy that we're forcing the muscle to use. So Roger, when we're you know, if, if we're lifting weights, we start to feel that pump in the muscle. And a part of that pump is this, this change in blood flow, where essentially the muscle is so desperate for more oxygen that it's, it's kind of crying out almost in a way. And it's saying, hey, we need more blood. And so the muscle gets literally pumped full of blood, but it still isn't enough to give the muscle all the oxygen it needs. And so the muscle is forced to use glucose as a fuel through this process of fermenting because it can't use it doesn't have enough oxygen to burn glucose or fats in the mitochondria where it uses oxygen and so it's it's, it's just using non-oxidative glycolysis the result of which is lactate being produced and so the muscle is producing a great deal of lactate releasing the lactate into the bloodstream and then the lactate then serves two purposes one and this is very overlooked lactate is used as a fuel itself even muscle can use lactate as a fuel. The brain very readily uses lactate as a fuel. I mean, it is directly moving the lactate in from the blood and burning it for energy in the mitochondria. So that's one thing. Lactate is very overlooked in that regard. It is a direct fuel itself, just like glucose or ketones. It's a fuel. But then second, the liver has this incredible ability to recycle the lactate. It takes the lactate in and turns it into glucose pumping it back into the blood. So we have this incredible recycle system where the muscle pulls in glucose, uses it for energy and pumps out lactate as a result. The liver pulls in the lactate and releases glucose as a result. And then the cycle just keeps feeding itself. This is a biochemical process called the Cori cycle, C-O-R-I. Um, but it's just all reflective of, of the energetic potential of lactate. So far from being a villain, Lactate is a metabolic hero to the working muscle. And it's very misunderstood in that many will say that it's the lactate that's causing the muscle soreness. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Lactate has nothing to do with muscle soreness. It does not contribute to muscle soreness whatsoever. Wow. So when that is happening, would you say it's okay and still advisable to continue training through this burning sensation? Yeah, so the burning that someone's feeling acutely during a muscle, um, during that during that set, um, that's likely, and I emphasize likely because we don't exactly know what's causing that discomfort. It's likely a result of an acute pH change. 
So if someone is doing squats um, or leg extensions and we put a pH or an acid base meter into the muscle with a little wire, and that wouldn't be very comfortable, you would start to detect that the muscle is becoming acidic. And so there is a pH change and that does aggravate neurons, which would be sensed as pain, you know, that burning, that, that burn that you get from the muscle as you go and keep pushing it through your, your set. Um, but that's likely that the pH change is not because of lactate, which isn't contributing to pH changes at all. It's probably a result of another biochemical process called ATP hydrolysis. So I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if your audience is somewhat familiar with this. <clears throat> ATP is the molecule that allows a muscle ultimately to contract and then relax, which of course is essential for, for a, 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 a rep. You know, we, we contract it, we relax it. ATP is what is allowing that muscle to happen. Every time this is happening, we are breaking apart, you know, thousands of ATP molecules. Every time we do that, every time we use an ATP molecule, we get a hydrogen molecule. And so it's that little hydrogen, that little H, as we identified it in chemistry, is what's then contributing to the pH change, making the muscle more acidic, which is aggravating the neurons, which we then sense as that burning discomfort. Yeah. So it's not lactate production. It's probably ATP hydrolysis, which is then resulting in an acute acidity in the muscle. Not systemically, Roger, you could be going full out and we'd be measuring the pH in your blood and your overall blood pH isn't changing. Because the body buffers, it, it, it handles these little pH insults very, very well and keeps it very tightly controlled. But in the muscle itself, we do detect a relative acidity. The muscle's becoming a little acidic, and that's painful. So is that like a, um, almost like a, a cross-reference of words of lactate and acid? So they just call mm -hmm. it... <laughs> yeah, so I think that is born from the earliest studies where they studied um, glucose metabolism in bacteria. So bacteria, um, they, they actually do produce lactic acid, but mammals don't. We, our complicated cells don't produce lactic acid because the overall pH is a very different, it's a very different environment. So bacteria do produce lactic acid when they're fermenting glucose. Humans don't. We produce lactate. And so I think that there was just, um, but you do see a pH change. And mm -hmm. so I think that gave rise to um, seeing what was happening in bacteria, seeing that you had lactate, not lactic acid, but lactate and a pH change in the human. And then we just sort of transferred, just like you said, we kind of connected the two erroneously. We are not bacteria, even though we start to see a general movement towards an acidic pH. Man, it's crazy how just a bit of information just gets just gets mixed up and people start treating it as the gospel. Yep, yep that's right. Oh, yep. So and it becomes I... Yep. And now everyone's blaming everything on lactic acid. And and you know, they'll say, Oh, the lactic acid is making my muscle sores. I gotta clear the lactic acid. And I tell them, look, you may as well say that you have little unicorns poking your muscles because that's just as real as blaming lactic acid insane did you mention a moment ago that it was the uh is it gluconeogenesis which can cause the breakdown of collagen mm -hmm. yeah yeah so uh cortisol is is so determined that's where i mentioned it but yeah so gluconeogenesis is a process whereby the liver will take other molecules and mm -hmm. turn it into glucose right. and one of the ways it can do that is through amino acids whether it's coming from, you know, collagen peptides or muscle proteins, all of those can be used as a building block to make glucose. So, right, right. Would that happen? I'm just trying, I'm just trying to think, is, 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 is that the reason why if, if people are having sort of like rapid weight loss, it's like extreme catabolism and it's eating away on the person's, um, skin collagen mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah it could be especially if they're yeah if, if they're eating a very nutrient deficient diet and they're super low calorie or kind of starvation diets that could happen wow okay it's kind of making sense because i thought well i heard that if, if you've got stretch marks it's 
it's to do with uh, it's a genetic trait. Well, it's yeah, so yeah, genetic. yeah. Let me, yeah, absolutely. There's no question. There's if you have someone who's like experiencing rapid muscle growth, or a woman whose belly is growing, and does she get stretch marks on her belly or not? There, that is very much a genetic component. Some skin just doesn't stretch as well as other people's skin. And, and that could be a result of the collagen composition in the skin. Maybe the person doesn't have enough. Mm -hmm. And so the skin is just a little, um, has a little less integrity. But yeah, there are, there's no doubt a genetic component. Whatever the nutritional component is to it, and I'm sure there is one, I don't know what it would be. Mm -hmm. You'd mentioned before about CGMs that it's not, I can't remember the word you said, it's, 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 it's not a great measuring tool to, maybe people are using it too much to check their, you know, blood glucose, but they should be focusing more on their insulin response. Yeah. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So my, yeah, my sentiment on glucose is that it's really the sidekick of the story. It's not the main character. And so if we want to understand insulin resistance or prediabetes or type two diabetes, <clears throat> unfortunately we are obsessed with glucose, you know, clinical, our clinician, we go into the physician or the GP and every year they're getting glucose measured and they, and the GP may see, well, you got some hypertension, you're gaining weight, um, but your glucose is normal, so you don't have prediabetes. But unfortunately, what's been happening behind the scenes is that the insulin has been climbing higher and higher every year. We so rarely measure insulin that we don't know. But normal glucose and high insulin is the state of insulin resistance. There's a lot of insulin, but it's just working well enough to keep the blood sugar in check. And then eventually the person moves to the point where even though they are swimming in a sea of insulin, the body is resistant to it, especially the muscles. And now we can't control blood sugar and blood sugar starts to climb. And then the clinician, the GP will say, ah, look, your glucose is climbing. Well, yeah, it's climbing now, but it's 20 years after the fact that the insulin had been climbing. Insulin has been fighting a war for 20 years keeping glucose in check. And the tragedy of this paradigm is that we, if we could just toss the glucose to the side, focus on the insulin for a moment, we could have detected this problem 20 years earlier before the glucose ever started to climb. So I like to put glucose in its place. I think we're too obsessed with it. We need to focus more on insulin, but a continuous glucose monitor, a CGM, can be helpful because it can show you the dynamic pattern to what you're eating. So let me let me just explain that for a moment. When we go into our GP for our annual visit, that's just uh, one single moment in time. It's looking at fasting glucose, and it can be like this, normal glucose, elevated insulin. But the beauty of a CGM is that you can eat some bread, for example, eat two pieces of bread, and you see what happens to your glucose, and you say, holy hell, my glucose has climbed up to, uh, I don't know, it would be in millimolar in the UK, maybe eight millimolar, and look, it stayed elevated for two and a half or three hours. That is a huge warning sign that when you load the system with glucose, because you're insulin resistant, it takes you much longer to clear it you don't clear it very well. And so a CGM, which can measure your glucose continuously, can be very illuminating in that regard. Because the beauty of the CGM is that it gives you that dynamic pattern. You can see what's happening in stark contrast to just a one and done, here's my fasting glucose from this one single blood test. Mm, right. You mentioned as well that um, insulin tests are pretty expensive or something yeah they're hard to well frankly in the uk um it sometimes is impossible to get because mm -hmm. the the nhs will just often say well we're just not covering it that's not covered because it is a more expensive test so depending on what the person has access to um it might be difficult to get now thankfully there are more and more gps in the uk who are focusing on on insulin and in the same in the us where depending on the person's health care um, their insurance may or may not cover it, but more and more insurers are covering it. Mm. What would you say is a good practice uh, lifestyle-wise to keep your insulin in check? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think there are three key pillars, um, and they're based on the three macronutrients. The first one is control carbohydrates. Not that we can't eat them, but we need to be focused more on fruits and vegetables 
eating them, not drinking them. Don't make a smoothie. Don't make a juice out of them. Eat them the way God intended. You know, you're eating that apple and you're chewing it up. You're not drinking the the fruit, uh, just the juice from the apple. So fruits and vegetables more than, you know, grains are going to have less of an insulin and glucose effect. So control your carbohydrates. And the less you're eating carbohydrates from bags and boxes with barcodes, the better you're going to be. And then second, prioritize protein. Make sure you're getting ample amounts of animal protein. This is dairy, eggs, or meat. Um, no, don't focus on the plant proteins. They are inferior. They're going to be more expensive. Just get animal proteins. And animal protein comes with fat, and that's the third rule. Don't fear fat. Dietary fat alone has no effect on insulin, so it's a very good macronutrient in that regard. And, and it comes with protein. Eat it the way it's supposed to be, which is fat and protein together. Amazing. Amazing. I've actually got some other questions, but I think, I think we're good here. I think we're great. That'll be, that'll be round two. Yes, absolutely. Ben, it's been incredible. And I definitely advise people to check out Ben's book. It's really good. Why We Get Sick, which uh, I believe is available on Amazon and yep. also Audible. Mm -hmm. um where can people find you you're on instagram yeah yeah i'm moderately active on instagram i should be more so about once or twice a week i will put together a little two or three minute video um of just some insight into human metabolism uh so i'll do that frequently so that's where people can find me at ben bickman phd um no c in bickman just b-i-k-m-a-n and then i have another i have an entrepreneurial effort roger so i'm not just scientist I, with a couple of my brothers we started a little a side business. I mean, it's growing pretty well. So it's it's called Health Code H L T H. People can learn more about this. The, a low carb meal replacement shake that I make, um, and it's uh, the website is Get Health and Health again is spelled H L T H. dot com. Unfortunately, due to restrictions in the UK, they don't allow the shipping in of foods that contain animal products, and so it's been very difficult. But we're hoping. That in the near future we'll have a UK distributor. But the, anyway, the website is gethealthhlth.com. Awesome. I'll make sure I put that in the show notes. Thank you so much, Ben. It's been yep. absolutely incredible. We'll definitely sort out a round two another time. <laughs> yep. My pleasure. This was great. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. You have a great day, sir.